everyone. Welcome back to Beyond the Q. Today, I am very excited to introduce our guest, Antonio King. He's the head of support at Viho. Antonio, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. <laughs> so I've heard that there is a lot of exciting growth happening at Viho right now, that y'all are growing like crazy, uh, particularly on the support team. So to get us started, can you just lay out for us what kind of growth is happening at Viho and then how that's affecting you and your team? Yeah, so I guess with a little background, I'll give you some context on what Viho is and what we do, um, and then we can kind of just dovetail right into the growth trajectory that we're on. So for those that don't know, Viho is uh, in the last mile delivery space. And what we do is we crowdsource drivers to uh, help us accomplish some deliveries across the country, uh, while also kind of leveraging them with proprietary technology that kind of helps shake up the last mile logistics space quite a bit. So think in a more uh, simpler term, I think Uber, but for package delivery, uh, so to speak. So at Viho, uh, a little more context on the growth there is that we as an organization, arguably in 2020 of August, um, the company size was roughly around 40, 40 ish people. Um, and, uh, today being, what is it? October 19th, we were about 345 and wow. of 345, <laughs> the support team is about a hundred. Um, and that's the support team across a couple different sub functions as well. Um, and knowing that we're really setting some super lofty goals for 2022, that means my team could very well look close to look like close to 300 people. Um, so quite a bit of growth, as you can imagine, and uh, a lot of really cool things that I get to kind of come in and, and help do as the as the function lead. Um, but at the same time, it's balancing the need to build some foundational aspects uh, that will hopefully get us to that baseline of a measure and then ensure that that baseline is then somewhat cemented to support all the additional weight we're going to have here in the next year uh, on top of just, you know, beyond that point is certainly what's top of mind and what arguably has been for maybe the past eight months or so now. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so it seems to me like there's kind of two things that you have to focus on for this growth, the hiring and then the operations side. Mm -hmm. um, so let's let's start with the hiring. Sure. So when you joined the company earlier this year and you knew you had all these hires to make, what did you do first? <laughs> yeah, great question. So I think like the first order of business was to get as much insight into my organization as I could. And I think I understood going into it that unless you're super close to the operation, you don't know what you don't know. So I understood that there's probably going to be more underneath the hood uh, once the hood was raised than maybe what the initial outside of the car looked like to those who had seen it just passing by on the street. I'm also just full of analogies, by the way. So if any of those don't make sense, <laughs> just let me know. Um, they kind of make sense in my head as I'm saying them and hopefully I just find my way along the way. But so I so the, the first point of business for me was to understand from those who are more in tune with the operation, what are the issues and challenges they see from their side? Um, and that wasn't just to initially focus on what hires are necessary, but it was to also help me understand what workflows weren't working, what uh, processes were not built to scale, what does our tech stack look like as it concerns support tools and, um, and, and kind of where what was bleeding the most and what needed my attention first. Um, and from there, I learned pretty quickly that the support team back in February of 20, uh, this year, 2021, um, the support team was around maybe 25, 25 ish people, and they were all centrally focused. So by centrally focused, I mean, they were handling inquiries from all of our markets, uh, markets or our cities are kind of what we call them, but all of our markets across the country at that time, which were approximately maybe seven or so. Um, but I knew very quickly that, that was not going to scale. So we had to sort of adopt a little bit more of a regionalized approach that allowed us to a make sure the team had a better life balance because having someone on the West coast work East coast hours is not the best and or vice versa. Um, 
um, on top of being able to support each uh, market or city um, in local time as well, because our time of operation is, is quite expansive. So kind of thinking about that in mind, as well as around like the scalability aspect of what we needed to look like, um, and this was pre-2022 goals, um, the, the decision for me was to start to establish a regionalized model um, that allows a support team to kind of help segregate and refocus themselves in areas uh, uh, that are kind of important. So with that kind of comes with building uh, or really, really maybe rebuilding the structure that was in existence. Um, and I would say like, I'd say structure was a very loose term of kind of what existed back then. Uh, it, was, it was really just, you know, a couple of point people running uh, the organization to the best of their ability while also trying to juggle what their responsibilities were. Um, and part of that for me was, okay, I've got to pull my supervisors out of the weeds so they can actually people manage, which is their job, um, which up until that point, they weren't really in the position to do so. So helping me understand, okay, great, the new approach is to regionalize this model. And this is just, by the way, one model for one subdivision. And this subdivision is arguably maybe 70% of the support org today. Ask me that question another year. They're probably going to be, I don't know, 50% or maybe 40% of the organization. But um, the key aspect was, okay, A, I need to pull my supervisors out of the weeds so they actually have time to manage people. Uh, and then B, we have to create a structure that aligns with what the regional uh, piece will look like, which means I have to figure out how to build in layers of, of management to sort of help alleviate me from having to be in the weeds as often, knowing the growth trajectory we were going to be on. And then that also kind of allows the supervisors themselves to step back a bit. So it came really down to understanding, okay, what are the areas I need and what is the level of expertise I need? I need people who can, who've got a lot of depth of experience of managing people and then who who have the experience of managing other managers as well, right? Which is a very different dichotomy than it is uh, the, the former. So that kind of gave me the starting point of what I needed to look for. But as the years progressed or eight months, so to speak, has progressed, I think that vision has um, magnified quite a bit as it concerns not just looking for people uh, who have led um, individual contributors and other leaders, but what other functional leaders can I have that allows us to run faster as a in a top down approach as opposed to going from the bottom up. Okay. So it sounds like you kind of went in better empowered the people managers that you did have as a starting point. Mm -hmm. um, but I imagine since you've hired over 80 people so far um, that you've probably been hiring some frontline folks as well. Yeah. So can you kind of just walk us through um, how you go about that hiring, how you kind of maintain quality control when you're hiring that fast and yeah. that many people? Yeah, I will say that uh, I think I can comfortably say for all of us in the support org that we aren't happy with where we are, even though where we are has progressed light years beyond where it was in you know February or even well before my time. Um, uh, but there, we still recognize there's a ton of opportunity to go, not only from the standpoint of recruiting at scale, um, but making sure that exactly what you talked about, the quality of hires that we get is very much at the bar of what we are, are looking for and sort of expect. So there's a couple different uh, steps that our associate levels kind of go through. Um, obviously, there's the initial application process where they fill out um, you know, their interest, uh, as well as giving us a little bit of depth in their background. Um, you know, I, I will say like, strategically at least implicit strategy for me on the support side is we don't really ask for anything as it concerns educational background because that doesn't really dictate what you do or what you don't know. What we are more interested in is learning, you know, A, do you have the attitude to learn what you don't know um, and or the willpower to learn what you don't know um, and or do you have a high ceiling maybe where you can come in and, and, and grow beyond maybe where your initial capacity might be. So we don't really ask for you know, to work in the support role, you have to have a bachelor's degree or, or frankly, any of the roles I think I have posted for my team, both at people leadership level, functional leadership level and or associate. I don't ask for anything uh, educational degree wise, because I think, you know, there's a lot of a lot of uh, different schools of thought on that. I think most of the world at this point in, in our day and age is starting to understand that that's not the end all be all. Um, so I'm very much in tune with that. So that also just gives us a much bigger pool of candidates to look at, um, which as you think through our model of being a distributed 
support organization, meaning nobody in the support org works in a physical office. Granted, nobody in the company does today. However, the support model is everyone's employed across the country. So it also gives us a bigger pool of candidates. So we don't want to sort of like, we don't want to minimize our own pool by sort of shooting ourselves in the foot, so to speak. So the pool candidate, uh, candidacy for pool is wide open. So anybody can apply to it as long as they have a stable internet connection, as long as they can meet the bare minimum, which I'll talk about in just a couple, uh, minutes here or seconds rather, um, then they kind of uh, have a fairly straightforward process to applying and hopefully getting the opportunity. But after the application process, um, we have them have an initial chat with the hiring managers. And typically the hiring managers for the associate level roles are those who are the supervisors. So I give them direct responsibility of hiring their own team. So that also helps them grow in, in kind of gaining that experience of the recruitment process or recruitment side of managing people. Um, but that also makes sure that we give our candidates the opportunity to learn who their potential managers are going to be so they can understand if it's as good of a fit for them as we are uh, or as they are for us. And I think that's very important that a lot of candidates, regardless of the role, don't really take to consideration too much. It has to be just as much of a fit for you as it is for us. So we, we hopefully give them that opportunity to understand who their potential uh, people managers might be. Uh, and then additionally, they go through a little bit of a tech exercise as well. Nothing terribly uh, difficult, I would argue, but to be, fair, to be fair, it might be difficult for those who don't spend a ton of time on the computer. Um, so uh, things around, can you create a screenshot or can you create a Google Drive document? Nothing that requires a ton of like technical expertise, but certainly is pivotal in your success uh, and, and being able to operate in, in this sort of a role. So after that, they go through just another cultural conversation, usually with a different uh, supervisor of a different team. And after that, they're welcome on board, uh, assuming there are no, no major challenges throughout that process. But, you know, we as an org as well are, are very aware that with our goals for 2022, we have to be able to find the same quality, if not better, with a much more scalable version of what we do from the recruitment process. So we're kind of in the process of iterating what that can look like to, to hopefully balance what we hope the, the pool of candidates might look like in the future. Gotcha. I'm curious, you mentioned that um, the attitude is a big thing that you look for. How do you go about determining that, especially when it's in the application Stage. Yeah, it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of behavioral questions um, and occasionally hypothetical every now and then. I think we we see maybe more hypothetical. What would you do in this situation uh, when we kind of go to the tech exercise? More behavioral, uh, you know, concerning tell us a time when um, you've gone through that sort of scenario. Um, just to kind of a hear hear what people have historically done. I think that's a pretty good leading behavior leading pattern on what behavioral trends could emerge uh and then b it also just gives us a chance to see how people think through things in the moment um you know sometimes you're going to be dealing with questions or inquiries that you have no idea on how to handle um so how can you problem solve throughout that moment to, to hopefully get to as close of a resolution as what makes uh, a reasonable amount of sense so um, a lot of behavioral questions and some occasional hypothetical to help us get a little bit of a well-rounded picture of what someone can potentially do Okay. So I'm curious for you as the support leader, mm -hmm. how much of your time is spent in the interview process or is it mostly, have you mostly delegated that to your team leads? Yeah, great question. I would say like the, the level of the um, applicant varies my involvement. So if it's associate level, um, maybe lead level, um, those that is typically delegated to all the supervisors to handle on their own or I start to get more heavily involved is what it involves people leadership um, direct accountable people leadership that's when I'm way more involved in it um, starting at the supervisor level all the way up through functional leaders and or you know senior managers of that degree okay so I'm curious uh, among those 80 or so folks that you've hired so far mm -hmm. how many of them are you know, people managers, team leads, frontline agents, yeah. and so on. Yeah. Uh, so if we're looking at people managers, I would say there's a total, well, let's, I'll separate like, I'll separate people manager and then function leader, even though some function leaders are overseeing people as well. But for the sake of like keeping this pretty straightforward, uh, 
people leaders um, in the straight sense of the word, I probably have around eight today. Um, functional leaders that may also include people management, there's probably, I think there's one. However, the intention is for that to, to kind of 4x, 5x in the quarter alone. So, um, but that's kind of the shake. And then of the associates and leads, leads are about, the ratio is maybe three to a team. Um, and that's to help cover a lot of the operational time frames that we're operating within, which could be anywhere as early as 5 a.m. to as late as around 10 o'clock at night. Okay. So when you joined Viho earlier this year and you knew you had this team of 20, 25 people and that mm -hmm. you needed to grow a lot um, and very quickly, how did you go about deciding uh, what kind of people you needed to hire first and how many yeah. I'm just curious how you thought through that. Great question. You know, candidly, uh, we were in a pretty unique position in that the support team uh, at VHO, everybody in the company was using some proprietary tools. And I think, candidly, the growth very quickly surpassed its ability to function at the degree of what we needed to. Um, so we were in a position uh, and we're just getting uh, to a much better position to where we can make more uh, educated um, or formulaic rather uh, guesses to what we actually need, guesses or you know uh, projections of what we need compared to what it was like in February. In February, uh, I couldn't tell you how long it took for an average conversation to be handled. I couldn't tell you how many conversations an agent were capable of handling within an hour. All of those variables for folks who are support operations people understand like those are very crucial variables that are needed to be able to understand what headcounts are necessary. Um, so it was a little bit of a shoot from the hip thing. I think one of the things my team had been doing for quite some time before my arrival was they got really good at feeling out kind of what their needs were from a from a capacity standpoint. Um, and it was almost kind of like, it was very impressive actually to see how accurate they were just from sentiment alone to go, Ooh, okay, it feels like we're a bit stretched. So we know we need to add a couple, maybe three additional people, depending on where the, where the stretching was coming from. And that's also maybe like one of the caveats of why the centralized focus uh, approach of the team wasn't going to work because you were always going to have variable growth from different parts of the country that if you didn't sort of separate and group together, it made it really hard to figure out where you needed to add more people because everything was always centralized. So um, so it was a bit of a shoot, shoot from the hip process, I'd say, for the first four months or so. Um, but we ended up leveraging a, uh, a, a third party relationship to help us get a little more um, methodical with the forecasting headcount. And it took, a, it took a lot of time, frankly, to get some of those variables in place so we could start to understand even just like a baseline of accuracy standpoint, what we needed and then compare that to what we had. And then we started to hire to what the plan said we needed. Um, or we're getting much better at that component, but that's also one of the reasons why we're in the process of looking for um, a uh, manager of workforce planning for the support organization alone, not just to manage what we currently need, but also help prepare us for what we need to look like here for the next year. Okay. Yeah. I was curious if there was going to be anything like that in your team. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, sounds very necessary. <laughs> <laughs> um, so within that, if you can share within that plan, mm -hmm. um, what were some of the criteria that you were using to determine um, where to hire like regionally and then how many people to hire? Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to break this down a bit. So, you know, one of the challenges around um, the business model that we have um, is there's two scopes of things that you sort of have to plan for as it concerns headcount or well, capacity forecasting and then real-time analyzing, assuming you get to that point. Um, but there's two, two aspects of business models that we sort of have to have two separate models for, one of which informs net new headcount that we need, and that's really uh, corollary to new markets or new cities that we're launching. And then there's organic growth, which means an existing market we're already in maybe is getting more volume or more business. So we need to uh, staff up the headcount for that. So those are the two buckets, right? Net new headcount and then, and then organic growth, um, each of which has very similar variables that we look at, but are just maybe 
look at a little differently. So net new market, as an example, if we understand that we have X amount of volume in, we already have historic data to show um, what our average handle times look like, um, and in turn, how many conversations we can solve in an hour, and translating that into how many people we are going to need for that initial launch of, let's say, Vermont. Um, and then on the other side of the house, we have the same variables, um, average handle time, uh, how many it takes to solve in an hour um, on average, um, uh, and then uh, kind of taking into mind shrinkage and, and um, you know, occupation or occupancy rather, uh, there's some, those other variables there can certainly tweak that number a bit, but that tells us, great, we have X amount of agents in uh, X amount of agents supporting the Toronto area, but now Toronto is going to be getting 25,000 more packages for the week. What does that 25,000 more packages translate into from a contact perspective? And in turn, what's the average handle time look like? And then what has the historic amount of conversations handled per hour on an average look like? And that tells us what net new headcount we need to support that additional 25,000 packages as an example. So that's how the this the strategy is interesting in terms of like how to leverage the two there. Um, and that's what I get to work pretty closely on with the workforce manager uh, to really help make sure that we have a, a strategy there that coincides with both um, both approaches and also is scalable to the sense that allows us to look at this from a year or two years out. Okay. So I'm curious, so for this new role that you're hiring mm -hmm. uh, for the workforce manager for support, what all will be their responsibilities? Yeah, great question. Um, so there, this role is a little bit of a, not a little bit, quite, it, frankly, it's a lot of strategic thinking. Um, I'd say as you need to think about not only what is the right model and or models? What do those need to look like when you think about those two um, components? And also bear in mind, we're still just talking about like this one subdivision of five. Eventually they're, they're going to be to support all five of them, but the biggest one that needs the attention first is, is the model we're talking about. Um, but the intention there is to say, okay, what are the correct models that allow us to get as accurate as we can get to support net new growth and uh, organic growth at the same time? Um, what does that models, what do those models need to look like at scale, right? What does it look like now at 100 people? But what does it also need to look like when we get to 200, 300 people? What does um, the right uh, communication strategy need to look like as it concerns everybody in the support organization at the leadership level being on the same page of, of net new market growth? growth and corresponding headcount needed and, and capacity planning as it concerns. Okay, great. You've got new volume coming in from the east. So here's what we've mapped out needs to come in to support that, um, making sure there's alignment there, um, working to help ensure that we have the right schedules and the right shifts based off of arrival patterns of contacts coming in, especially knowing that there's different arrival patterns for different parts of the country because they all are their own unique operation, so to speak. So there's a lot of a lot of getting to build, which frankly, all of the roles I'm recruiting for are very much roles that are, that are needing people who love to build from the ground up. So a lot of ground up building and a lot of once that's once that baseline is created, how do we move to iterate on that so that we're ahead of the curve as opposed to behind it, giving the growth that we're looking at? Gotcha. Sounds like an exciting role. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, yeah, so it sounds like hiring has been a massive focus for you since joining VHO uh, earlier this year. Mm. But I also know that with with all that hiring and all that good hiring comes a need for structure, <laughs> tools, systems, processes, all of the operation stuff to support those hires. Yeah. So can you tell me a little bit about what you've been doing on the operations side of things? Yeah, I would say arguably this is what the last eight months for me has been is is building um, some foundation. So I always kind of like to use the analogy of like the support team for VHO has kind of been in this um, house of mud and sticks for quite some time, and that, and that was fine back in August of 2020 when you know the elements of the storms weren't nearly as demanding, and you know this team had uh, a roof over their head to help them get things done. Um, but you know. We are in 2021 and the storms have, have grown and, and ability and, and strength. And while other teams uh, in the organization are starting to just like build 
skyscrapers in this metropolitan area is starting to kind of emerge. The support team is just finishing laying out the blueprint for their their their, their one level flat, right? So, so, and what I mean by that analogy is like there's a lot of foundational aspects that are still being built out, which ideally would be built when you have a much smaller team than 100. But building some of these foundational pieces when you do have a team of 100 just means we have to be that much more delicate in how they're done. So as a really good example, um, the focusing on that one division again, uh, there's two teams that live in that division today, one of which supports our driver partners on the road, the other of which supports the customers who are receiving parcels from those driver partners on the road. Um, so the driver uh, support team in specific, nobody in the support organization has had uh, – measures of accountability before. Um, so they, no one really had an idea of like, how good am I doing other than just kind of hearing anecdotally that you're doing great and that's really all there is to it. But a lot of the team had been yearning for a better understanding and, and better sense of visibility of how, how truly am I doing around like my job other than just being told you're doing great. Like, are there, is there any data to support that? So my team, uh, so like part of the, part of the, the scope for me, like for two months was, um, once we started migrating to a tool um, that is a contact center based tool, we use uh, Twilio Flex for our contact center. Um, and while if you know anything about Twilio Flex, it is one of the most robust contact center tools uh, in the market. The challenge with that is that um, you need the resources to develop it into the way that you want it to be. So when you think about it from that perspective, it's a little bit of a slow rolling process to kind of build out what we want it to be at a baseline level and then build out what we want it to be to go beyond that point. But part of the baseline level was introducing measures of accountability to the team. And I knew, okay, this is a team of like 60 who have never seen measures of accountability throughout their entire tenure at this organization. I have to be very careful of how I roll that out to make sure that, you know, there's naturally going to be some angst. There's naturally going to be a little bit of anxiety associated with it, but I have to roll this out to give a everyone on this side uh, a better sense of visibility of how they're doing, but introduce them to what the norm is. And having measures as a team member and support is a very baseline thing that uh, Hopefully you have and you understand going into the job, here's what you're going to be accountable for. But this team had not had that. So um, so establishing like that baseline as an example among several others has been what some of my focus has been over the past eight months on top of general tools and what legacy workflows exist that probably shouldn't exist that we've just been doing because it's just been a staple for so long. Um, that uh, has been on my radar to go, great, how can we optimize what we do uh, at the baseline level while I find some functional leaders to help take over more areas of ownership around iterating beyond that baseline level uh, when they kind of get through the door. Okay. So you mentioned that, you know, instituting some of these um, performance measurement uh, things when there's already 60 people on the team and that it's kind of a delicate balance. So how did you approach that mm. so that you get these things in place without totally disrupting uh, the existing team? Yeah, um, it's interesting. So I, I think initially when I came in, you know, I, I really made it the point and I still do today to like to make sure my team understands that like I will always be transparent, open and honest, even when it's not good news and or even when it's uncomfortable for all of us because that's i think as a leader that's really important to help establish the trust that you need to be able to sometimes make unpopular decisions uh, or uncomfortable decisions such as rolling out measures of accountability that you've never seen or maybe have had before so i knew kind of going into this that what was important was to be as transparent and open and honest around this process as i could be um, and that include giving them insight into um what the data was that we we're going to be collecting and starting to share um, as it concerns uh, measures of accountability, helping them understand why that data was important for us to understand and for everybody to have visibility into, um, making sure they understood like what the correct usage, my opinion at least, what the correct usage of data is in comparison to like maybe the qualitative insight that data doesn't give you. And I think like setting up the setting up the introduction of measures with Data is not the end all be all. Data is only designed to tell us a component of the story. And from that point, it's our job to dive in to understand why the data shows it that way. Um, kind of really starting with that 
the intention was to help them understand that, yes, all of a sudden now that you have measures of, of, of accountability, that's not the only thing we're going to look at to determine whether or not you're doing your job well or not. Um, but it would be a conversation driver for us to focus on what could be areas of opportunity that we now have better visibility into that we didn't before. Um, so giving all that up front and like writing this, I wrote this two page document that just outlined everything from like addressing that there's likely anxiety around it, addressing that it's uncomfortable, um, but also helping them understand that like, while uncomfortable now, it'll hopefully give everybody the insight they've been yearning for for quite some time, as well as everybody now has a better sense of understanding how they're doing in comparison to what they think they're doing. Um, uh, uh, and that was a super big driver for us as well. And I think the last piece I'll say around this was that despite the rollout, um, I knew that wasn't going to be the end all be all over the process. I knew I still needed to be available around any questions. So my team does a really good job of we do um, AMAs every month or ask me anything every month to where I typically am the person that gets the questions the most and that they're not like centered around me per se, but they typically are with me running the AMA or at least getting the questions asked. And I don't have my team give me the questions beforehand. They submit them via form, which one of my supervisors then just moderates, but I don't see the questions beforehand and that's intentional because I wanna make sure I'm giving them genuine responses. Even when I don't know something, I'll tell them, I don't know the answer to that question and I'll follow up with it. So I knew um, after asking some supervisors after the rollout, how, what was the general sentiment over some of the measures, some of the supervisors candidly said, hey, I think you know it may be beneficial to talk about this or maybe field some questions from the team in the next AMA or the next weekly team meeting. So I happily did that, sat down, camera on, tell me what concerns everybody has. And people threw questions left and right and, and I answered them, which I, which I hope I think I did well. Um, but after that meeting, everyone, at least my supervisors told me that that helped tremendously as people were able to get the questions off their chest that they maybe had a little more anxiety about that I was able to address in public. So um, all in all, be transparent about the process, um, understand and acknowledge that it's going to be uncomfortable, um, and just be, be sure that you are helping people understand the benefit behind the intention um, and that it's going to be a little rocky to start with. That's just how changes work, especially when you have large teams like this. Um, and then just being available for questions and being open to feedback or anything that might happen. Not necessarily saying you have to implement said feedback, but being open to it is, I think, what anybody and everybody just hopes at the bare minimum is that you at least listen and are heard. Okay. I love that idea of doing the monthly AMA. Was that one of kind of the other functions that you decided to establish when you joined VHO or was that something they already did? No, it's something that I did when I started. And I think the intention there was to make sure um, that everybody, because when teams grow very widely like this or largely rather like this, it's very easy for there to be a very big disconnect between leadership and maybe your entry level employees. Um, and having come from like the trenches and support, I completely understand everything that they go through because I've also gone through it in my, in my career. So I wanted to make sure that they constantly had, um, visibility of me, even if it was just like, like, I'll tell you some of the AMAs, they balance between 50% personal questions, 50% professional questions, personal questions being, Tones, how do you feel about like DC or Marvel? Or and we spent a long debate on this. At, like two questions around like tones. What do you think around like? Are we going to get to a point of having better support tools? Like so, the the questions vary all across the board, and that was also the intention to help lighten the mood a little bit, to help add a little bit of personality because that's what a lot of people don't get to see from their bosses is personality. It's often very much just project or work or your performance. But when you get to be human with people, it kind of just shows you in a different light that I don't think people will often see from from their bosses. So I try to make sure that I'm as, you know, level as they are so that they understand like challenges that are going to happen and or I understand from them what are things that are top of mind that I need to focus on now that I get to hear it straight from them. Oh, I love that. Yeah, it's definitely way more fun when you kind of get to know your boss as a human being as opposed to just the face on the screen. Totally. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that like that's kind of the first functions that you started with mm -hmm. um, and that you've got some others on the horizon. So what are some of those other functions that you're wanting to 
implement in the future. Yeah. So I'll say like of, of the five functions, one of them is like, if we were to like target a year of maturity, like, I don't know, year one to zero to how do, how do infant ages work? I don't know. I don't have a child. So. <laughs> um, let's just assume zero to 12 years of maturity. The delivery support function was this function that we've been talking about the most that has the largest amount of people. Um, and those two teams that support two different cohorts of, of customers. Um, that team's maturity as it concerns like growth is probably at about eh, a year old, I would say. Um, the other functions that are within the support org are much less than a year old, I think arguably as old as maybe six months. Um, everything else is still relatively new. So building that from the ground up is very much a component that all of these are going through. But delivery support is is the biggest. And again, that's the team that has two teams. One supports the drivers, one supports customers. Uh, then we also have trust and safety, um, which is a team that handles all high risk and legal um, incidents, uh, ranging from criminal behavior to scope of work violation. Um, and then we have support operations, which is a team that's relatively new, and that team is consistent of, think quality assurance, think workforce management, think knowledge uh, and resource management. Um, and then you have our training and development team. We have our own T&D team that's responsible for new hire training, but then their scope will expand as well to help encompass more maybe traditional L&D. So think of if we want to do, um, if we want to design an empathy course or we want to design a course on de-escalation, we may say those are prerequisites to move up the ladder and support as you have to certify in those courses that that team puts on and or trains against. Um, and the last team, which is a team that was just inherited uh, within the past month or so is our driver operation support team. And that's the team that handles driver inquiries that are anything but questions around active deliveries on the road. So think registration questions or questions and, and payment and, and payout history, things to that degree. Okay. So how did you go, like, walk me through your process for deciding what each of these sub, sub functions should be and then how to go about establishing those? Yeah, great question. I think <laughs> arguably most of them have probably uh, surfaced that's not fair. I was going to say some of them maybe surface on a whim. Um, trust and safety was a fun one. Uh, that one I have experience in as well as it concerns like a little bit of my career past. Um, but as an organization, we had just seen some really unique instances um, happen to where I said, hey, it probably makes sense for us to think about like how this sort of incident is going to, to magnify itself as we get bigger. Um, and at that at that moment in the past, uh, my boss, uh, he goes, yeah, you know, I, I think you're right. You know, it probably doesn't need attention right now. Um, just kind of given like how like how minimal it's happening, but certainly, you know, think through it a little bit. So after thinking through it quite a bit and then having an instance happen, that was like a catalyst for that team's like birth right out of the gate. Um, that's when that team sort of became a team was when we uh, had more incidents that we had to deal with, which is just a natural ebb and flow of how the business works, right? Um, so trust and safety was kind of born that way. Support operations was one that um, has kind of come up the more I've seen the growth of the support team start to, to enlarge in itself. And I think part of that challenge is because as teams get bigger, um, there are so many nuances that also need to scale to ensure consistent operation or the baseline of what you want it to be, but it becomes more and more of a full-time role, the bigger the team gets. Um, and some of those sub functions like quality, uh, and workforce and knowledge management, um, I would have argued were probably would probably have been beneficial for us to get done a little earlier. Um, but when you talk about just like growth, especially like, the, the huge amount of growth that we've gone through and will go through in the next year, you sort of have to pick your battles a little bit to figure out which one needs the attention versus which one can wait a month or, or two months or what, what have you. Um, but given the fact that what we're going through or will go through in 2022, I was like, nope, okay, we have to do it now. Otherwise, we will just find ourselves consistently behind the curb. Training and development, that one came up um, because we had some internal folks who were just like, 
running it as well as they could have run it, but they were also juggling other things as well, right? Startup environments, you're often wearing several different hats. And I knew that with the growth trajectory we were going through, it would make a ton of sense to just have a dedicated group to focus on new hire training, um, designing new hire content, um, making sure that all new hires come out of the training with the, the baseline minimum of um, an understanding of the role and, and the responsibilities included, as well as continuing to iterate that so we can get that time of training shorter and shorter and shorter so we can move faster on being able to employ people around uh, and into the team. So that naturally needed its own focus to where that team also just grew from uh, three people, sorry, four people, and that's inclusive of a manager to, I think, what did that what it's at today, which is about six people inclusive of a manager. Um, and then I'm forgetting one team, Driver Operations Support, which is a team that's, real, that's inherited. Uh, they are, that team was already in existence. They were just living in a different side of the organization. Um, but after conferring with that organization's, you know, uh, head and myself, we both made a decision that it makes sense to bring them underneath my umbrella. Um, so while they are still relatively new as it concerns to the support organization, they've been established for quite some time, um, but they still have a ton of opportunities as well to, to iterate beyond where they currently are. Um, and what's interesting is like every single function has its own strategy that needs to be associated with it, but it all needs to sort of pile up into what the overarching vision for support is. So as I start bringing in some of these functional leaders, they're gonna work with me to build out strategies for their functional areas that will ultimately tie into the overarching strategy that I'm building for the entire support org. So uh, so it's, 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 a, it's interesting just to have that much strategy work that needs to be done while also having a lot of the tactical things need to be done at the same time. And I think the word of the calendar for me for the past eight months has been paralleling right? It's, it's the need to do the tactical, but some of the tactical cannot get done until some of the strategic is done, but some of the strategic can't be done until some of the tactical is done. So it's just this vicious circle and cycle that just continues to roll, which is, has been a really uh, a lot of fun for the past eight months, I'd say. Yeah. I'm curious, how do you balance all of that? Great question. <laughs> Still haven't figured it out. Um, <laughs> you know, candidly, it is a lot of delegating. Um, which, you know, if there's one thing I could give any new leader that's that's budding um, in this space is you must learn and be comfortable delegating. If you don't, you will never be able to finish everything and then you'll constantly feel like you can't get anything done. My days arguably are 80% mm, meetings, uh, which means there's 20% of the time I have there to get things done, which realistically I'll start something and then I'll get pulled into something that needs my attention right away. So, so in order for me to be able to accomplish anything, I have to be able to delegate it to, to the folks who, um, a are interested in growing beyond their current capacity at some point may not be two weeks or a month or a quarter, but giving those people ideas and projects to be able to take and run with while sort of being like the executive sponsor, so to speak, or the guardrail, um, when and if they need it, allows you to get a ton of things done uh, simultaneously while also being able to delegate and just trust your leaders underneath you to get things done themselves too. Okay. I love that. Sounds like a lot, but a good challenge. <laughs> um, I'm curious in, you know, kind of looking back over your eight or so months at VHO, is there anything about you know, all this hiring, establishing the operations, all of that. Is there anything that you would do differently if you could go back? I probably would say move faster to some degree in things. I think part of the challenge for me is the business is, was, it is relatively new. And coming in in February, there's a ton, like there's a very different ramp up time for an entry level associate to the head of an entire function, especially when that, that function has a lot that's really unknown about it that no one really knows that you sort of have to kind of come in and uncover yourself. So um, moving faster and things, I came in with the approach of going, okay, depending on the amount of time I have, as we talk about new markets or new cities, if if the time frame looks like one or, or two new markets, maybe realistically one market a month, I have the time to sort of figure out where I can leverage internal talent to help level them up to, to sort of help take on some things. But then I think I quickly learned after like uncovering more and more that not only do I not have the time 
to level up internal people who may just not be there quite yet, the experience necessary to be able to jump in and effectively make an impact right away likely does not really lie internally yet. Um, so I knew I had to sort of shift focuses a bit to figure out, okay, great. I need to shift the approach from going bottoms up to top down if we need to move as fast as I think we need to. And it turns out, yeah, we need to go much faster um, than that. So I'd say like, I would have come in and, and probably made that assessment faster, but learning the operation and trying to piece together things from different people where internal knowledge just lives in their heads and you have to go find which heads to pull that knowledge out of. Uh, it took a bit of time to get to that point. Um, but yeah, that's something I'd probably say I would have done a little differently back then. Okay. So I'm curious in a, in addition to those monthly AMAs, mm -hmm. um, how, and, and given how fast you're growing and just how quickly things are changing, how do you go about kind of maintaining your team's, uh, culture, yeah. happiness, fulfillment, and all of that. Great question. So we do, um, and I think I had a couple different team members kind of bring this up at like our support leadership level, and I delegated it to, to our training and development manager to run and kind of like ideate and, and sort of like propose kind of what we do. But we typically do um, something every Thursday, and that can range from, I think one time we did Jack in the Box. So if you're familiar with like gaming, Jack in the Box, we did like some Pictionary game there where people can draw and like, um, and I also realized I am just a terrible artist comparison to some folks on my team. Um, so we'll do uh, Pictionary for lack of a better word, or we'll do um, AMAs, or we'll do um, uh, social hours, uh, gaming nights, or training refreshers. And typically they'll rotate to where we're doing one of those every Thursday. Um, and we might time it to where um, I think like Fridays actually is like a, it's like murder trivia, I think. Um, so but we try to do all of these things to help encourage people to, to, to get involved. It's certainly not mandatory, um, A, because the business still has to be able to function. B, we recognize not everybody is going to be interested in staying on their computer for an extra hour or so. Um, those who choose to, they get paid for it should they want to. So we, so we sort of you know, make sure that they have that option there. Um, but we also just want to make sure it is an option for folks to sort of explore if and when they want to without feeling like it's an obligation to do so. Um, but the turnout's usually pretty decent, I would say, about maybe 40% of the org, um, since it's open to the entire support org, not just one team, shows up. But it might vary depending on the time of which is selected, which that team, we call them nothing original, but they're the party planning committee. committee um, very similar to The Office, if you if you know or, or are familiar with that show. But that team is a team of maybe like seven to eight volunteers from entry level to uh, supervisor who just want to volunteer to put events together for the entire support org that think through the times, the days, uh, anything else that might be crucial to think about before doing an event um, on a specific day. Okay. Very cool. Um, as much as I could like keep asking you questions about all of these <laughs> things, that's probably a good spot to start uh, wrapping us up. Um, but before I ask you my last question, yeah. is there anything else about this topic that we haven't covered yet that you would like to add? I guess I would say just don't be afraid to advocate what you need for. Um, uh, which, let me say that again. Don't be afraid to advocate for what you need. I think like organizations, especially who are going through hyper growth, um, sometimes have a, a habit of maybe overlooking some small components and nuances that might not be terribly new to them or, or familiar to them. So you, you have to do a really good job of, of advocating for if this growth is going to happen, that means we need X to be able to support it. Um, and, and being able to sort of position things that way will start to give all the other areas of the business a really good understanding of like, what other nuances are involved uh, to make sure that you can be successful? Because if support fails, um, then that's generally not a good thing um, because your customers are dealing with that team primarily. So advocate for yourselves and for your team, uh, especially in hyper growth, because sometimes the focus can be lost um, to say growth is what we're shooting for. And, um, you know, not for the sake of negligence, everything else falls by the wayside. But when, when the focus is growth, 
you have to be even more vocal now because you have a, kind of, a ton of other things to compete with on making sure that your voice and, and your team's voice is heard for what you need. Okay. Well, that kind of segues nicely into my next question. This is the like big, broad one. Ooh. But <laughs> um, just in general, what advice do you have for up-and-coming support leaders? Leverage other support leaders, actually. Um, you know, we we are some of like the most empathetic and helpful people in the world that it's always kind of surprising that even off the clock, we still are that way. Um, but find communities that you can join, um, newsletters, podcasts, whatever you can to help you get different perspectives of how to handle problems. Um, because I guarantee you the problems that you're probably going through has already happened to some leader, multiple leaders at some point in their own journeys. And all the time I've noticed that we are more than happy to share how we've combated similar challenges in the past. So don't think around like, don't don't rack your brain trying to reinvent the wheel that's been invented well before you may even realize it was a wheel, but ask questions to similar uh, support leaders and you'll be surprised that uh, you'll get a lot of your resources and answers from very similar and like-minded folks. Love that. I have definitely noticed that throughout interviewing support leaders for this podcast, that everybody is just immensely kind and empathetic, generous with their wisdom. So love that advice. Um, Well, thank you so much again, Antonio, for taking the time to talk with me today. I'm really excited to share this with everyone. Appreciate it. And let me know if there's anything else that comes up after the fact. I'm always happy to help. Yeah, will do. Um, Before I let you go, is there, if anyone listening or watching wants to learn more from you or learn more about you, what's a good way or where's a good place for them to do that? Sure. Um, If folks are familiar with the support driven Slack community, that's, I feel like I'm present there all the time. And if I'm not careful, I could spend the entire day in that community answering and asking questions myself. Um, So that's a really good place to start. So if you aren't familiar with it, just Google support driven Slack community, um, sign up there. And once you get in there, there's no like cost to join, if I remember correctly. Um, There's no uh, sort of barrier of entry. Um, So feel free to just Slack me in there. At Tones is my Slack handle. Um, And or find me on LinkedIn. Always happy to connect there too.